everybody and the uh, Institute for inviting me. Uh, my first time talking in New Hampshire. I'm actually a West Coast person, so kind of excited. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to outline sort of the terrain of, of what's going on in philosophy with, with the issue of immigration. I'm going to present to you then a, a one attempt to try to reconcile some of the problems, and then I'm going to try to convince you why that one person's wrong and why I think I've got something better. So let's see how, how the, if I get to all of that. So first of all, the immigration issue. When, when philosophers deal with the issue of immigration, they typically focus on the following two concerns. For the first question you're going to want to ask is, does a political community have the right to be self-determined? You know, and, and what exactly does that involve? The second concern is, do all persons have the moral right to be free and equal? And what does that involve? So these are going to be the two concerns, and, and you'll see them come up in, in, in any position that, that someone takes on immigration. So the first position we're going to look at is what I call the communitarian nationalist position. So I'm, I'm painting with a kind of a broad brush here and putting two, two groups that, that might have tensions with each other, but kind of putting them together. So the communitarian argument runs something like this. Communitarians and nationalists focused on, on the first concern. They think that a se the self-determination of a political community is primary. That's what's most important, is that a community be self-determined. If a community is not self-determined, then, then, then it runs into problems. Right, so without self-determination, the political community will either, they claim, disintegrate or it'll be unable to provide distributive justice. So let me look at the first issue, the first issue first, the disintegration of the political community. So the claim is that part of the definition of being self-determined is that, a, sorry, part of the definition of being a self-determined political community is that you can have the, you should have the right to control your boundaries. If you don't have the right to control boundaries, you're not, you can't be considered a, a self-determined political community. Okay. So no boundaries, no community. Now, this could be a problem, not, not just in itself not having the community, but this could be a problem, for example, if you think of communities as a source of value. So think about things that are valuable to you. What are the things that you value the most? I mean, one, one of the things that stick out is, say, family, your friends. And one of the interesting things about, say, family, for example, is you didn't get to pick them. It wasn't like before you were born, you were kind of given a list of potential parents, and you got to pick which one you wanted, like some sort of vending machine. Right? And in fact, the, the point is that, that it's a lot of the times, the fact that you didn't pick your parents, that's why your parents you, are most valuable to you. The things that you don't necessarily pick are the things that are most valuable to you. So without a community, you don't have any values. And so the idea being here is that if you don't have boundaries, you don't have community. No community, no values. So it's got both, there's both an intrinsic issue here. Without, without boundaries, you have no community, but there's also like an instrumental issue here. If you have no community, right, you sort of lose, you, you lose your value, you, you lose the foundation for values, right? So therefore, no self-determination, no values. So that's why self-determination is so important here. Now then there's the ability, the inability to promote distributive justice. So this is a second concern. So if you're in the communitarian nationalist camp, this would be your second concern. And the concern runs something like this. So how should society, how should society's goods be allocated? Now by goods, I mean things like resources and jobs. So we have these goodies. We have resources and we have jobs. The thing with these goodies is that they're finite. We don't have an infinite amount of resources. We don't have an infinite amount of jobs. So who should get priority? And the argument is, well, members should get priority, right? Just like you have a duty to, uh, to help out members of your family, you ought to help out members in your community first. Right? So, th you know, think of it this way. If you could only give one person, you, you're, you're carpooling to work, say, and you can only give one person a ride to work, do you give a ride to your sister or do you hold some sort of random lottery for, you know, strangers in the neighborhood? Right? If, if you did that, people would think, well, there might be something wrong with you. You just take your sister, right? You, you, you family first. So if there's only a finite amount of resources and jobs, you should give them to your, to your co-members first. Now, there's also this issue of social trust, because it's not just about jobs and resources, or resources the way I would take about, about you know, things, but there's also the idea of like, a, like the welfare state, social safety net, social safety nets, <coughs> um, you know, entitlements, for example. Right? There's only so many seats in a school, for example, that you can have children in. Right? There's only so much uh, you know, uh, uh, money that, that you, can, you can give for uh, social programs. Now, the argument is if a lot of the people who use these services are not quote-unquote members, 
the members who pay into these services are, are, gonna, are not going to be very happy. And they're going to be less likely to support, say, you know, like a wel the democratic welfare system. So you need social trust. These, these, these sorts of uh, entitlement programs require social trust. And you can't have distributive justice. Distributive justice, by that I mean when, uh, when you try to rectify really gross inequalities. It would be hard to have distributive justice if you don't respect this distinction between members and non-members. So let me sort of summarize the communitarian nationalist position so far. Here's the conclusion. The political community has the presumptive right to exclude non-members. By presumptive right, I mean all things being equal. The political community has the right to exclude non-members. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't raise concerns that, that might outweigh this, this right. But all things being equal, the political community has the right to exclude non-members. Right? The reason for this being that community cohesion requires boundaries. You can't have a, a cohesive community if you don't have boundaries. Open borders, in this case, would be equivalent to no boundaries. If you have open borders, you don't have boundaries. Now, if this doesn't motivate you, there's still a second argument that we looked at, right? There is a moral difference between members and non-members. And the argument here, as we saw, right, members of the community are entitled to things that non-members are not. And open borders makes these privileges available to anyone. So if you have open borders, they argue, then everyone becomes a member. So this, in a nutshell, is what I call the communitarian nationalist point of view. This is the argument that, that communitarians and nationalists make. If anything, I kind of want you to f at least feel the force of this argument. Right, you can see why this, this, this argument can be compelling. Now, on the other side of the debate, we have what I call the liberal cosmopolitan argument. So this is the other side of the debate. This side of the debate argues that a commitment to individual freedom and universal equality are essential to human rights. You can't have human rights unless you're committed to individual freedom and universal equality, in some, to some sense. Further, they claim that we have a moral duty to defend human rights. This, this seems intuitively correct. I mean, who wants to say, no, we, don't, we shouldn't defend human rights? So this, this seems intuitively clear. We have moral duty to defend human rights, and anything short of open borders, they argue, will violate one or both of these commitments. So if you don't have open borders, they argue, you're either going to be in violation of individual freedom or you're going to violate your commitment to moral equality. And so like I did with the other argument, let me go through both of these. So first, individual freedom. The claim here is part of, being a, you know, part of individual freedom is the freedom of movement. That's a, that's a fundamental part of individual freedom. That seems right. If you don't have the right to move anywhere, right, you, you, you can't be free. But does that mean that you have the right to go anywhere? Can, can you all could just come into my apartment anytime you want? Does me closing my door right, you know, limit your freedom of movement? Right, so there's, there's some limits. There should be some limits. But you can't, you can't say that, there is, that you don't have some freedom of movement. So how can you be free again when your movement is restricted? So closed borders, they argue, infringes on the individual's freedom of movement. And in a significant way, it's not like me just keeping you out of my apartment. It's like me not letting you leave this room. And here's the argument. So imagine that you live in a horrible state. And you're not allowed to leave this state. Are you, are you free? The answer is no. You should be able to exit. And most, almost everyone agrees with that. But because the ability to exit a country is dependent on the ability to enter another, closed borders right, creates a problem. It would be like me telling you, look, you're free. You're free to leave this room. You're just not allowed to enter the other room. Right? So having the right to exit entails that you must have the right to enter somewhere else. So this is how they argue that, that individual freedom is constricted whenever you have any sort of, any sort of closed borders. When you, don't, when you don't have open borders, individual freedom has been constrained. Now, if, if this doesn't motivate you, there's still the second argument, which is that, well, maybe you're interested in moral equality. All persons should be treated morally equal. Right? So the, 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 the argument runs something like this. Arbitrary inequalities, inequalities that can't be justified, are morally repugnant. So let me give an example. LeBron James is a better basketball player than me. I'm going to go ahead and admit that here. He's better than I am. Now, does that mean that he should have the right, that his vote, for example, should count twice as much as mine? No, of course not. It shouldn't count twice as much as mine. Right? Because that's, that's, that's arbitrary for, 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 you know, 
for uh, po counting you know, political votes. But if we're talking about being paid for basketball, right, then that inequality is significant. Does that make sense? So that, in that sense, okay, then, then, then that inequality matters. Now, how about the place you were born? How relevant is that? And that's really the question that, that, this, that comes up. Where you're born, it turns out, greatly determines your life chances, but it's also arbitrary. You didn't pick it. It's, again, it's not like just before you were born, you know, someone pulled out a map of the world and said, where would you like to be born, Jose? And I said, well, you know, it's going to be November, right? So maybe, uh, maybe Baja California is nice that time of the year, right? No, <laughs> I didn't, you didn't pick it. You were just, it was an arbitrary thing. And it greatly determines your life chances. So how can you both support the idea that people should be treated morally equal and yet have this arbitrary inequality greatly determine people's life chances? So the argument goes, globally speaking, closed borders deny people the ability to rectify this arbitrary inequality. Okay. Now this claim gets even stronger. Some people like uh, Shelley Wilcox pushes this claim even further. And she says it doesn't just, it, it's not just a, a, a fetter on, on rectifying this arbitrary inequality. But the border itself perpetuates these inequalities. So the idea being that imagine if all the goodies in the world were, were in this room, or all the goodies of, uh, of, of Manchester were in this room, and we wouldn't let anyone else come in and get any of the goodies. Then the, in that sense, so that would be the, let me go back here, that would be the first part, where it's just, you know, we, it, we're not, closed borders wouldn't allow you to rectify the inequalities. Now any of you who've had like siblings, like a brother or sister, you fight over toys and candy, for example. If I go and I take all my sister's toys and candies and I run into my room and close the door, that would be the second one. Right, does that make sense? All right, so we've got two different issues here. In, one's a stronger case, one's a weaker case. But in both, in both cases, closed borders themselves prevent you, at the very least prevent you, if not actually perpetuate moral inequalities. So again, the liberal cosmopolitan conclusion, a commitment to individual freedom and or universal equality demands that borders not be closed. So again, there's a strong version which says closed borders are a violation of human rights. So in this case, someone, you know, if, you, if, you, if you buy into the freedom of movement argument, right, closed borders are actually infringing on your freedom of movement. Or if you take the uh, inequality case in the strong sense, the border themselves are creating inequalities. And there's also the weaker version, which says that closed borders obstruct attempts to rectify human rights violations. So in both cases, it's preventing, if, if you support human rights, closed borders in each case right, pre either prevent that or actually are, are themselves a violation of human rights. And this is kind of where we find ourselves. So here's the ethical dilemma raised by immigration. So, so some people are on the communitarian nationalist team, other people are on the liberal cosmopolitan team. And the dilemma is something like this. Can a political community's right to be self-determined be made compatible with a commitment to individual freedom and moral equality for all persons? Right, so if, if you're interested in philosophy, and in particular the immigration debate, this is the question you have to try to answer. Right, can, can these two things come together? And the reason you have to try to answer this is because it almost doesn't matter on what side of the debate you fall on. When it comes to legitimizing a political community, you usually get some sort of, well, a legitimate political community should be democratically self-determined and it should also respect human rights. And as I think I've tried to show you, you can see how this, this creates a tension when you try to deal with the issue of immigration. So in most, case, in most cases, a political community could be democratically self-determined and be committed to human rights, but in the immigration issue, it seems like the two of them butt heads. So what do you do? So in comes Christopher Heath Wellman. So his article has, has been very popular in, in philosophy circles. It, it was in the journal Ethics, which is probably the one or two biggest political philosophy journals. And his essay was called Immigration and Freedom of Association. And in this essay, Christopher Heath Wellman argued from a liberal perspective. Right? Remember, remember I just told you before, liberal perspectives usually support open borders. He argues from a liberal perspective Right, that a legitimate state has the right to control immigration. Right? Now by a legitimate state, he means a state that is, that is a, demo, a democratic political community that respects human rights. 
So if you're not a democratic political community and you don't respect human rights, then Christopher Heath Wellman says, well, then you don't have a right to control immigration. And it's a presumptive right, again. All things being equal, a sta a political, the state has the right to control immigration. His argument, I think, is the, well, the virtue of his argument is that it's wonderfully simple. I'll give it to you. It's in three premises. Premise one, legitimate states are entitled to political self-determination. Again, a legitimate state, a democratic state that, that supports human rights, those states are entitled to political self-determination. It seems hard to argue with premise one, right? So we'll give that to him as well. We'll give that to him. Second thing he says is freedom of association is an integral component of self-determination. You can't, you can't be self-determined unless you have the right to freedom of association. It just doesn't make any sense. How can you be self-determined if you can't you know, control who you want to associate with? The inverse of that is a freedom of association entitles one not to associate, and here he uses the marriage example, and here's where it's gonna make sense. He says, think of a legitimate political communities as autonomous individuals. So as an autonomous individual, I can go and I can propose marriage to somebody, but you as an autonomous individual, say I come up to you and I propose marriage to you, you as an autonomous individual, you have the right to reject my marriage proposal. You don't have to accept my marriage proposal. And it's similar with legitimate states and immigration. States have the right to let whoever they want in. But if they don't want to associate with non-members, they have a right to rebuff their, 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 uh, their, their request. So here's his conclusion, which is actually a very strong conclusion. Legitimate states are not morally obligated to take in any potential immigrants, even those desperately seeking asylum. And he has ways of getting around this. He says, well, look, if someone's seeking asylum and you don't want to associate with them, you can pay another state to take in asylum seekers. So it's kind of interesting. He, he, he bites the bullet on this. He says, no one has, no immigrant has, has the right to enter any state. Now, there's been a couple of object objections already raised against uh, Professor Wellman, and I'm just gonna go through them re really quickly. The first one's the harm objection. I just say, Christopher Heath Wellman's already committed to the view that it's sort of mo almost a utilitarian view, that you, can't, you can do anything you want up until you start harming somebody else. And once you start harming somebody, then, then your, 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 limb, your freedom is, 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 is reined in. And the argument has been, well, the exclusion of immigrants presents a potential harm to would-be immigrants that is serious enough to check or at least demand further justification for a state's right to exclude non-members. So the idea being something like, um, so if, if you perform a, a certain job, right, you might have to work in almost sweatshop conditions if you work in country X, whereas you would be paid really well if you worked in, in, in country Y. And so the fact that you're being excluded Right, is actually harming you. Also, we can also talk about refugees and asylum seekers, but again, uh, Wellman's got ways around that. But the idea here still being that what happens with exclusion is that immigrants are, are, are harmed in such a way that the state doesn't, doesn't rect rectify that, sorry. The people who argue this are, are Sarah Fine and Shelley Wilcox. There's a second objection. I call it the bad analogy objection. And we already started to see this a little bit with the marriage proposal. Wellman uses two types of analogies to make the case that freedom of association is essential to self-determination. The first one he makes, we can call it intimate or expressive associations. These are things like marriage and religion. So if you're, a, you know, if, if, you are a, if you're an autonomous individual, and you don't have the right to rebuff a marriage proposal, you're, you, you know, you're, you're, your autonomy has been violated. You can say the same thing for religion. One of the things about religion is that it should be able to control its own membership. But these are very intimate and expressive associations. There are also these innocuous associations like golf clubs. So if a golf club won't let me join, right, do, do I lose, well maybe I do lose much. I don't, I've never joined a golf club. I don't know why he uses a golf club. I know very little about golf clubs. If it's like anything else, right? It, it, it's not like, a, I'm assuming, my livelihood's dependent on me joining the certain golf club. I can always start my own golf club if I want to. Right? Notice these aren't the same sort of associations, right? It's not like you're marrying somebody when, when you let them join your golf club. 
It's not like you've let them be a part of your religion. These are very different types of associations. And, and the, the objection has been that the first one, the intimate expressive association, supports the strong freedom of association that Wellman's argument requires. But the second doesn't. The second doesn't have that same strong freedom of, the same strong sort of association. And yet it's the second that makes his argument consistent with liberalism. So if you're a liberal, for example, you don't want the state to be like a family. How oppressive would that be? I mean, just think about it. You know, that, that you, you, your, your politicians, your senators, your congressmen, your president, right, they're, that you're associated to them in the same way that you are your family. It's almost too thick. And there's a third objection, which is the equivocation objection. So Wellman equivocates with two, if not three, different types of exclusion. So the first one is that a, state, a state's right to exclude outsiders from its territory, preventing non-members from crossing its borders. So this one is, imagine if you're, you're, uh, you're a Mexican national and you're trying to get to Canada. All you're trying to do is just get across the, you know, the U.S. The US right? Notice this is a different type of exclusion. The person's not trying to get residency or citizenship. The person's just trying to get across. So that's one type of exclusion. There's a second type of exclusion, excluding outsiders from settling within the territory. Right, so preventing non-members from acquiring residency. This would be like a legal permanent resident. And then there's a third type of exclusion, which is excluding outsiders from membership within the political community, preventing non-members from acquiring citizenship. So these are three different types of excluding, but Wellman conflates all three. And what people like Ryan Pevnik have argued is that his argument really only allows for this last one, the third one. If we go back to the marriage analogy, the religion analogy, right, he, he, can, he can argue that outsiders should be excluded from membership, but he doesn't have much of an argument for residency and even less for just crossing into the territory. So that's been one of the problems with Wellman's argument. And, and, and let me give you an example. Have you, I mean, have you seen like, the movie Bridesmaids? Some of you? This opening scene there, I think, it's, I think it's boot camp or yoga, I can't remember. They're doing something at the park. I think it's boot camp. It's like this boot camp. And the, the two characters, they go to the park, and they're not part of this boot camp training. They haven't paid for it, right? They're not members of it. But they start doing the boot camp type exercises along with them, just to the side, right? Because they have a right to be in the park. So the, they couldn't be prevented from being in the park, but they could be excluded from being in the boot camp you know, exercise unit, right? So this is, this is the same sort of thing. There's three different types of exclusion. Wellman conflates all three. Now, these are all objections that have been raised against Wellman. I, I'm sympathetic to some of them. Uh, some of them I, th I think need more work, and some of them I think you can get around. Here's what I want to introduce to the debate. So far, what you've seen, all I've talked about is admission and exclusion. And I, you know, I think I'm right about this, but we'll, we'll see. Maybe we'll leave it up for the q and I think where, as I say, where the rubber hits the road when it comes to ethics, what philosophers aren't talking about is the ethics of enforcement and expulsion. One thing is to determine what, what are the ethical issues that come into determining your admission and exclusion criteria. The other issue is what can you ethically do to enforce your criteria? And I think these are two different questions. And let me say something about this. So like I said, they, they haven't gone beyond these admission exclusion issues. And yet, uh, as, I, as I started to say, two of the more hotly contested topics in the immigration debate are on enforcement expulsion strategies. So here's the first one, prevention through deterrence. This was actually something bigger in the 90s. The idea being that if you want to enforce the border, what you do is you put a lot of basically people, guns, technology in areas where it's easy to cross. And then you have people, if they, and, if they want to, and if people want to cross, they have to cross this you know, terrible terrain. The idea being that the terrain itself, because it's so deadly, would actually deter people from crossing. So you almost, what it actually did though, however, is it funneled people into these areas. But the idea being that you use the terrain itself. The other one, this one's actually more, it's, uh, it was bigger with, with, with Romney talked about self-deporting. This is the enforcement through attrition policy. You make life so miserable in the country for immigrants that they start to self-deport. So there's two different strategies. 
One is a strategy of on the border, actual border enforcement. How do you enforce the border itself? The second one is an internal strategy. How do you enforce these immigration policies internally? So I want to start with the question of border enforcement. So what I'm curious about, or what, if any, are the limits to strategies that a legitimate state, remember we talked about a legitimate state being a state that respects human rights, may deploy in enforcing its immigration policy. And I want to say that strategies like prevention through deterrence that deploy deadly force right, for what's essentially a misdemeanor offense, they don't seem to give non-members equal moral consideration. Now there's, and, and I'll say more about this difference. L l but let me, actually, let me say this now. There's, moral there's equal moral consideration and there's equal political consideration. So one is we treat all, you know, the idea of human rights, you treat all people as, 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 as having moral, or moral consideration. Now when it comes to citizenship, the idea then is people should be treated as political equals. So in one sense you have political rights, one is moral rights. So enforcing the border, right, what, do we, what, do, what, what can we do to non-members? We grant that they don't have the same political rights but they still are worthy of moral consideration. If you respect human rights, the non-members should still get equal moral consideration. What can you do at the border to prevent people and still be consistent with, with, with human rights? Right. So I think that a truly liberal perspective would insist that legitimate states have a presumptive duty, not a presumptive right, they have a presumptive duty not to violate the moral equality of non-members. This is the case even and especially when respecting this duty would compromise the state's ability to control immigration. Right? In short, legitimate states do not have the presumptive right the way that Christopher Heath Woman thinks to enforce their immigration policies even if they're free to determine them. So even if I grant Christopher Heath Wellman all that he's sort of been asking for, that a state has the right to uh, determine its admission exclusion criteria, I still don't think that that proves that they have the, the state has the presumptive right to enforce immigration policies any way it likes. It's a different question. So the question of expulsion. What limits, if any, does a legitimate state have in deploying strategies for locating, identifying, and deporting undocumented immigrants? So strategies like enforcement through attrition, they not only have effects on non-members, but also on certain groups of members. And here's what's interesting. And this is sort of my response to the communitarian objection as well. Or at least I'm appealing to the communitarians and the nationalists in this respect. One of the things about being, a, being on the communitarian nationalist side is that you should treat all members as equals, political equals. Remember we said that the difference is between members and non-members. So all members should be equal. But when you have strategies like enforcement through attrition, this isn't going to affect the com all members of the community equal. It's go it, the burdens are going to fall disproportionately on some people. Those people who happen to be, you know, who look like or resemble or, or live in immigrant communities. Those people who are citizens, full citizens, will then come to have this almost stigma of second class status. So from a communitarian nationalist perspective, you need to put in some limits on what you can do on internal enforcement. Right? So again, these sorts of strategies seem to have the potential to undermine the political equality of all citizens. Like I mentioned, this is, this is essential not just to liberalism, but also to, communita to, uh, to communitarians and nationalists as well. But at this point, I, 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 my focus is still someone like Wellman. And, and like I said, Wellman is, is coming from a liberal point of view. So the conclusion here. My argument is the presumptive right, at least in, the, in cases of immigration, is not on the side of the state, but actually on the side of immigrants, including undocumented immigrants. Why? Well, philosophical inquiries into the issue of immigration can't be divorced from questions concerning enforcement and expulsion. And believe it or not, this is actually something that, 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 that's kind of debated. When, when, when philosophers talk about immigration, can we divorce the issues of admission and exclusion from issues of how you actually enforce these admission exclusion policies. So I think you can't. And when these questions are taken into consideration, I think we find that the following. From a liberal perspective, a commitment to the moral equality of all persons demands that no state 
have the unconstrained right to deploy enforcement strategies. A commitment to the political equality of all citizens demands that no state have the unconstrained right to deploy expulsion strategies. Both of these things should be, should be reined in to some degree. The presumptive right should be on the side of immigrants, not the state in these cases. Okay. Some arguments the presumptive right is, on the, is not on the side of the state, but actually on the side of immigrants, including undocumented immigrants. And this position I refer to as a minimalist defense of immigrant rights. So now when, when I say a minimalist defense, I don't mean that, that I think that immigrants only deserve the, the most minimum of rights. But what the position I'm trying to stake out is that there's like a ground floor, a base bottom that you, no human being can fall below. Right? And from here, I think we can actually start to build a, a, a larger sort of edifice for immigrant rights. But when it comes down to who's, it, it, this is the question of philosophy, who's got the presumptive rights? The presumptive right on the side of the state or is the presumptive right on the side of the immigrants? I think when you get down to the base bottom, it, it, it's on the side of the immigrants. There's certain things that a state is checked in doing, even when it's trying to do these to non-members. Certain things a state can't do, if it's committed to human rights. Okay. So my position rests on the belief that a respect for human rights can only be made compatible with democratic self-determination if the former is given priority over the latter. And what I, what I wrote my dissertation on was to try to show that, that there is still a way, part of my dissertation was to show there's still a way to, for a state to be self-determined even if it doesn't have complete control over immigration. There's still a sense of, of being a sovereign state. Right, so you don't quite lose that as a state. So I've, I've kind of thrown a lot at you, and I've, I'm actually hoping that we can have a really good kind of Q&A discussion. This usually generates a lot of discussion. All right, so thank you very much, and curious to see what you all have to say. Questions, comments? Th thank you for that wonderfully clear, uh, very well presented talk. Um, I have a question about um, enforcement by deterrence. Is that the right phrase that uh, you, you were discussing? The first one, the, yes. the, the border patrol. The, not, sorry, not the, the, the expulsion, one. but the yeah, the border, yeah, yes, yes. the fences that were funneling people towards more yes. dangerous terrain. Yes, you use the phrase, you said that that's equivalent to using deadly force against people who are trying to commit a misdemeanor offense, right? That was right. how you criti criticized it. Um, um, I wonder if that phrase, using deadly force, is really accurate. And let me let me just um, say. It seems to me what we have here is a case of foreseeable, though perhaps unintended, side effects. That, I mean, suppose it seems to me any physical barrier to immigration, any fence or wall or whatever, could um, have the effect of leading some people to engage in really risky activity right. to get around that or over that or under that barrier, right? They could dig tunnels that could collapse. They could, or suppose the, the whole border were fenced and the only way around it was through boats or swimming through shark infested waters or traveling on rickety boats. Would you, um, is it really accurate to say that that's always tantamount to using deadly force to keep people out? I, that's a great question. Um, so, so maybe I, I, I overstated my case here. More than, I, I think what I should have used is, is proportionality. What, what's, the, what's a proportionate amount of, of force to use? So uh, you're right, if, if we had a certain situation where there's shark infested waters and so forth, there's a certain sense where it's not like you put the sharks there. But what's different about you know, the, um, the uh, enforcement through, through deterrence is that what it actually does is that if you look at some, of, and I should have cited some of these studies, what the studies showed beforehand is that what's going to happen is you're actually going to funnel people into these areas. So you actually, well, the problem with my problem with that enforcement strategy, it's not that it was an act of God, for example, that created this sort of disaster. So like sharks, for example, being in, in, in a water, for example, you didn't put the sharks there. But there's a sense where the strategy itself was we're going to design the border uh, enforcement in such a way that we are knowingly going to funnel people into these, sort of, into these dangerous areas. And then even when the, when the reports came out about you know, 500 people dying a year and so forth, no, nothing was done. And some, you know, something should be done when you have a strategy that's, that's yielding up this, this many deaths. Not saying that that means you, that you, should, open, you should open all the borders. 
but that probably tells you something might be wrong with your own immigration policy. Does that, does that make sense? If you had, you know, it, say you, you can do whatever you want in your backyard, but if you have people dying in your backyard, there's a certain sense where you, you might have to start taking, at a certain point you might have to start taking responsibility for it. I don't know if I'm answering your question or. In the United States, one of the only ways that you cannot become a U.S. citizen is if you are a woman who's been a prostitute. And I was wondering if you would consider that a violation of human rights and if countries have the right to exclude them for this reason, especially women who have been forced into prostitution or have been sold. Is, is, is that, do they still have that? The, uh... Yep, they do. Wow. Yeah, they, they, there's, uh, I, 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 the answer is yes. I and mean, there's been a lot of really unfortunate um, laws. Um, if you were homosexual, for example, you, you were considered a social deviant. I wonder if that's part of it. It was, it was called like social deviance. And so it was this huge category that, that captured a lot of people. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think the, uh, the, 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 whole, you know, the whole sex trade industry, there's a lot of women who then want a way out. And, and there's really nothing in the system for them, necessarily. It, it, it's hard to get even like asylum status, for example. So, um, no, I, th I think you're right, yes. That'd be the short answer to that. So, um, going off your very first introduction of the liberal argument yes. and your conclusion, um, given that you think that um, the argument is actually on the side of the immigrants, um, does that imply like the strong argument in favor of like open borders? In other words, great, great question. So, so like, let, 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 well, let, what let, are the legitimate? What, what are what are the legitimate cases to deny people freedom of movement across borders? If what you say is true, so when when do you have the right to uh, to, to um, like given your argument, right? In what cases, uh, like in, in other words, your argument implies that um, very few border restrictions at all are legitimate, and I'm wondering what are and what aren't. So that's, that's a great question, I, and, and this is sort of a, what philosophers do. Now, now what I've sort of done is, is, is I've served the ball back over to the, the closed border camp. So I'm kind of waiting to see, if, you know, I'm trying to get this, part of, part of the thing I'm trying to do is get this published. So I'm trying to see what other reactions come, come my, my way. I, at this point, I would, you know, I, I would personally be in favor of open borders, but I know that philosophically that's going to be a hard position to defend. And so what I defend is just the minimalist. And this is why I showed the strong and the weak case. So I think that all I need is this minimalist case just to try to provide some protection for immigrants, especially undocumented immigrants. There's just certain things that the state should not be allowed to do. I, I don't think you should be allowed. I think it's disproportionate amount of force to raid someone's home. I, I just think that there's, there's a certain proportionality. What, what, what is the actual violation? Right now in the books, to be an undocumented immigrant, Right, it is just a civic violation. Right, so does that give you? I mean, we're, we're do what we do to immigrants, raid their homes. What we do to drug dealers, right, it's a, there seems to be too. Dis it's it's very disproportionate. And so what I'm just trying to provide is sort of a, a, a minimalist base argument in defense of immigrant rights. But I think you 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 you've sort of caught me where I'm going with this. I I, I at the end I, I do want to argue for something like open borders. But that's going to be a lot stronger argument. It's going to be a lot harder one to make. Now, I see you smiling, so you might have something else. No, I, I, that was my question. Yeah, I was just wondering if your minimalist position is in part due to having a minimalist view of human rights. I'm kind of wondering what is the conception of human rights that you're uh, envisioning here? That's a great, great question. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking of this in, in a very simple kind of basic sense, where, where you have positive rights, things that you're entitled to, 
right? So, so the idea being that you, if, you're a, if you're a child in the United States, you're, you're entitled to an education. Notice and that's, there's a certain sense where someone's giving you something. So it's a positive right. There's also, then there's also negative rights. And so I think of it as minimalist is, is I'm arguing it from, from a negative rights perspective because I'm also trying to get as many people as I can on board, right? So if libertarians want to come jump on board and defend immigrant rights, you know, the more the, 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 more the merrier. But libertarians are going to have really hard times with, with more positivistic rights. But they're going to be okay with the negative rights in the sense that there, there are certain things that a state should not do to you. Like, like, that just stops. You have, there's a certain dignity that all human beings have. And so it's not, it's not in the sense of minimalist, and this is what I was saying, it's not minimalist and this is, this is it. Nothing, there's nothing more. I mean minimalist as in you don't go below this. And then there'll be other positive rights that I think people should be entitled to. I, I think all children should be entitled to education. And the Supreme Court agreed with us in, in, in 1983 with the Plyer v. Doe case. Right? All, all children should have a right to education. All human beings should have a right to emergency health care. Right? These are more entitlement type things, but then that goes a little bit beyond the minimalist. Thank you very much. How are you a, doing? A good presentation. Uh, and I like very much uh, your distinguishing between uh, claims of morality and then distinct claims about the enforcement of those. Um, but I, I wonder sometimes about the, the, the strength of your minimalist conception because it, it can sometimes be the case that when uh, someone breaks a moral law or doesn't honor a presumptive right, you're admitting the, the, the presumptive right to, to, to monitor immigration, um, but you're suggesting that uh, our right to be treated in a certain way prevents us from enforcing that right. right. Um, but sometimes it seems that uh, when people violate rights or when they, when they act morally wrong in, in uh, another way, it's impossible to rectify that, those wrong actions. Uh, without performing some, without violating some other duties. Uh, so it, it, it might be the case that in order to, uh, that enforcing all of the laws against theft, for example, right. uh, since theft is primarily carried out by people who have low income levels, uh, that uh, it requires certain types of enforcement policies that would uh, disproportionately affect people of low incomes um, so that if, if your argument is right, it may seem to prove too much because it seems to prove that if the enforcement strategy for any right, no matter how powerfully we might justify it, you know, rights against, against murder, for example, I mean, murder might be proportional, disproportionately carried out by people who are mentally ill, um, and that our enforcement strategies against murder and violent crime, or prevention strategies for it mm -hmm. might involve disproportionately uh, impacting them. Um, it would seem that that would provide an argument against really the enforcement uh, of anyone. If, if people are going to violate certain laws, oh, uh, and they're going to do it in sufficient numbers, uh, our not making sure that we don't violate any of their rights may make our ability to enforce any of our laws impossible. So, yeah, so there's, there's two things. One is uh, proportionality. So you, you know how some places will have like a little metal detector? So back to the, the, the stealing thing, you have like a metal detector? It would be disproportionate, for example, if you crossed, you know, instead of like the thing just beeping, so you, you, you pocket like a little piece of candy or something, right? And the thing would beep. So instead of beeping, like it blew you up. <laughs> you know, do you see how that, that would be disproportionate? So it's just a fact of, it, it's just, it, the, the force that you can use to prevent this is too much. Not saying that you shouldn't prevent theft. So I'm not, that's, not, that's not what that would be saying. It would say you just can't blow people up. The other question, though, so, the, so there's one is disproportionality. The other one is, is turning people into sort of a second-class status. So one thing would be if, if, it was, uh, if it was justified for any person who was of a lower class walking down the street for the police to pull them over and check them to see if they were stealing anything. So just because you were poor, you were then subjected to the, this sort of a this, this, this sort of inspection. Now what you could do is, you, I think you have two options. One option is you can go for the, what we could call the airport security model, which is that, well, in this case, because we really want to stop theft, any person on the street almost randomly can be pulled over by the cops and, and frisked and, and, and checked. It doesn't matter who you are. It's just kind of a random thing, kind of like they do at the airport. So we're all subject to this. Now notice a liberal is not going to go for this, because how much power is that giving the state? And so the other option you have is, okay, if we're, if we're not going to make this so that everyone is subject to this sort of random inspections, 
is that we're going to create certain, certain, certain stops, certain checks. Here are certain things that the Border Patrol can't do to people. Not so much because we think that the non-members have these political rights, but because we want to defend the political rights of citizens so they don't get put into the second class status. So there's, there's sort of two things going on. One is the disproportionality, and the other one is the political rights, which is you don't want to turn people into second class citizens. And, and so this, this makes it so there's two things going on, and that, but that doesn't mean that you can't enforce laws on, on, on theft. It just means there's certain things that you can't do, either, either because they're disproportionate or because you're going to subject, you're going to turn certain members into the certain second class status, which is rejected by both liberals and communitarians, interestingly enough. I think there's something a lot more nefarious than uh, what you're talking about right now, second class citizens. Stopping pe Mexican nationals uh, crossing the border, um, you say it's disproportionate, but what happens to a lot of immigrants is they end up being enslaved by um, unconscionable business people who use them, get them in debt, and they live you know, lives that not only are under the radar where they have no rights anyway, but they're terrible labor uh, conditions. So sending them back or you know, preventing them from crossing the border is not necessarily disproportionate when you think of you know, what happens to a lot of people who are undocumented. Right. So, and, and this is, a, this is another one of the, um, so the, the minimalist rights. I, I, I don't know if you know this, but you know, if, if you work for somebody, whether you're documented or not, if you work for somebody and they don't pay you or they make you work in horrible conditions, there's, you can actually complain about this. You can, there's actually recourse, but immigrants are so scared. Right? They don't actually do this. So, so uh, one, one of the uh, day labor unions in Los Angeles and even in Eugene, Oregon, one of the things that they do is, is educate you know, workers that as a worker, you have workers' rights. And this is part of what I talk about, the, uh, the, the sort of protections that, that cover everybody. So it creates a sort of firewall between you know, police officials, you know, domestic policing, and border patrol. Because without this firewall, right, there's going to be a lot of nefarious bad things happening that you can't do anything about because you're afraid to go to the police. Right? If the police become border patrol agents, right, then you can't you know, report crimes. You'll be afraid to be a witness if some, you see someone else, the, the, you see another crime committed or someone, you know, someone gets murdered and you're a witness. You'll be afraid to come to the police if, if you don't have this firewall between the two. So one of the things I advocate for is exactly that, a, a firewall between these two things, the, 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 the immigration enforcement and, and the policing. Because if, if you don't have this firewall, A, it could be a, you're, you're not treating you know, undocumented immigrants as, as equal moral agents, and B, you're going to be undermining the political equality of some of your own citizens. Yes. I don't have a question. I just want to make a statement. Please. Um, we've had walls before. We have the Wall of China. We've had Hadrian's Wall. And we've had the Berlin Wall. They've all come down. At this point, we have our wall between Mexico, and we have the Israeli and the Palestinian wall. And all I'm wanting to just bring out is somehow time makes the change, and the change seems to be that those walls didn't work. That's all I wanted to say. So I agree with your statement about democratic nations have an obligation um, to protect human rights of members and non-members. Mm -hmm. But I guess I'm wondering where, in your view, um, what sort of punishments are OK? Because if there's no, no one telling them that they can't enter or, or there's going to be repercussions for it, then they're going to keep doing it. And you know more problems are going to ensue. So I'm wondering what's a justified what do you think is a justified um, way to protecting human rights, but also like, you know, making sure that illegal immigrants don't come over? So, what? Or, 
Yeah, I guess undocumented is what I meant. And, and, and actually, maybe you want to follow up on this. So, so here, and, and again, I and, and, I'm, and I'm okay if, if people kind of feel like I, I might be, you know, skirting this issue. I feel like what I'm trying to do is, is with, I think Christopher Heath Wallman's argument was very powerful and very persuasive, and I don't know if I did justice to it when I presented it here, but it really put a lot of people who were on the immigrant rights side, like myself, on the defensive. And mm -hmm. so what I've sort of tried to do is now push the ball back. And so that's actually a question that I would want to ask, you know, someone who was who thinks that the, that that part of being a self-determined nation state or a self-determined political community is having the right to control immigration, then my question is, well, can you explain to me what it would look like to control immigration in a way that's consistent with human rights? And sort of what I do, and I know it, 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 it's kind of, a, it's, it's sort of unfair, because then I'm like, a, I don't know if you, you guys probably remember Dikembe Mutombo, he's this big center, he used to just block shots. And that's kind of what I'm, what I'm doing. People say, well, what if we do this to immigrants? And I say, no, this is why. So, so it's, and I get to ask this quite a bit, like how would you, you know, how can we do this consistent with, with human rights? And I, and it might be unfair, I always like to turn the, well I don't like to, but I always do. I turn the question back around and I say, well no, you tell me, it's because it, I don't feel like it's my job to tell you how to control immigration, because I'm trying to, at the end of the day, like I said, I, I, my own personal position is an open borders position, but which I feel is gonna be a lot harder to justify philosophically. So it's a position I've been trying to work out philosophically. At this point, I've only gotten the sort of, let's call it the minimalist framework. Right. But I, I, I sense your frustration, but I don't know, maybe you oh, can. Oh, I'm not frustrated, I'm, I'm confused. I mean, I don't agree with, uh, you know, killing people at the border and, right. you know, bursting into people's homes. So I was actually wondering what you thought would be an alternative, a better way to handle the situation. Because I, clearly that's something our government and right. the citizenry can't, come up with an answer. So I, that's why I was genuinely no, it's, asking. It, it, it's tough. Um, you hear a lot of people saying, well, enforce the border first, but you know, Obama's deported over 400,000 people last year. Um, for the first time in a long time in certain parts of, of like Texas, for example, you have immigrants who aren't from Mexico. Mm -hmm. Me you know, Mexico's not sending as many immigrants they sent before. Um, so you know, the, the, the enforcement aspect of it, you know, it's, whether I agree with it or not, seems to have work, and then my, my view is, if you really are interested in, in controlling immigration, come up with policies that reflect like empirical realities. One of the problems with the 1965 uh, immigration reform was that it basically cut, you know, Mexican immigrants by, uh, Mexican immigration by about 90%. Before 1965, it was about 200,000 immigrants, you know, according to May Nye, a historian, about 200,000 immigrants who would come to the United States annually. They cut that down to 20,000. The first time they ever put caps on people from, from Latin America, or from, from, from the Americas. And so when you do things like that, what is, what is that gonna do? You're just gonna create the quote unquote illegal problem. Right. So I, I, I would say come up with more, you know, um, more, more empirically realistic immigration policies that, that, um, that defend human rights. But I, the, the question you ask me is, is, is a question I get all the time. Right. So it's, it's a good question. I just, you know, yes, uh oh. <laughs> um, well, one of the things that I've been thinking about um, since there has been a lot of recently proposed um, ideas sort of across the, the aisle, yeah. uh, Democrats and Republicans about how to deal with comprehensive immigration reform. Um, and one of the things that I think concerns me is that all of them, all of these suggestions really seem to increase the power of the administration, executive branches, and the power of the border patrol, uh, and uh, these enforcement mechanisms that you're talking about, and you emphasized that they make um, that if we have too much enforcement uh, within the U.S. of you know these um, self-deportation laws, mm -hmm. that they disproportionately affect certain s certain groups of citizens, yes. um, certain groups of members. But um, I wonder if you couldn't even push that further and say that um, with the actually the increasing uh, surveillance, increasing um, mechanisms for uh, sort of watching immigrants, we might actually, any person who is a member of the US might be increasingly at risk. Um, so I don't know if that question makes sense, but it seems like you could say, yes, certain people are being made second class citizens, but we're also risking um, uh, all of us being asked for papers all the time, which might be something that everyone is equally uh, sort of, um, Vulnerable to you. So, yeah. no, th this is a good point, and this was a this was a go back to a, a David's point, which is that 
when you have internal enforcement and, and, and you sort of are committed to the political equality of, of, of your citizens, you have really two options, which is the, the airport option, which is that, well, then everyone's subjected to this sort of, of, of interrogation. So you're kind of like a big brother, like 1984 big brother, which is sort of what I heard you kind of worry about. And I think that's right. But what someone could say is, well, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna subject everyone to this. I mean, most most people are, are, don't want to carry around like don't want like a national ID, for example, right? You don't want to have these biometrics. People get upset about body scanners at the airports, you know. So you're right. So when, the way you couch it, say, well, we just have this in an effective, targeted way. So it turns out that 80% of of, uh, of undocumented immigrants come from Latin America. So if you want to do this in a targeted sense, such that you don't subject all your citizens to this kind of internal enforcement, then that's where the second class citizenship comes in. But I think you're right. I think the, 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 the worry, at least, is that, well, isn't this creating sort of a big brother? We, so we, 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 we allow the, the government to do these sorts of, of, of an internal enforcement procedures for immigration, then pretty soon it's going to spread to other things, right? So I think that's right. I thought we're, you know, the other, well, I'll, I'll see what. Sorry, I'm back. Um, That's right. So, one of the huge issues in immigration is um, people who are brought over when they're a newborn oh, baby yes, who yes, are yes, yes. illegal, and then they find out when they're 18 years old and they're trying to apply for colleges that they're an illegal immigrant. Now, I'm wondering what you think if, does the state have a right to exp expel these people if they do it in an ethical way, or do the people, because they already feel like they are a member of the political community, have a right to stay? Ask like a good philosopher. That's right. I, 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 yes, I, I, su I support the Dream Act. I support the Dreamers. And this, if, if in no other place, this shows shows you shows you the arbitrariness and ambiguity of where you're born. You're born somewhere, and some of these kids, like literally, like six weeks, they're brought to the U.S. And some of these kids, it's heartbreaking. They don't even know that they were undocumented until like you know they, they want to go get their driver's license at 16 they go to their mom and dad and go hey I, 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 it says that I need my social security card and my birth certificate so wh where, do you, where do you have those mom dad it's like sorry you know you weren't documented so yeah I, I think you're right the, 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 part of the second part of your question is well, what makes you a member and this is, this is always kind of interesting, because what, what would a, someone like a nationalist would say, it's, it's where you have these sort of connect, it's not just where you're born, it's almost like where you have these sort of connections, connections to the soil. I say, you've been here 16 years, that's a lot of connections. I say, you could almost make a communitarian nationalist argument in support of the DREAM Act, which is kind of interesting, right? Because as I told, as you saw at the beginning of, the, of my talk, it's usually the communitarian nationalists who are, you know, an, an, somewhat anti-immigrant. But here you've kind of could say, well, based on your own principles, what would you support dreamers? Hi, I just wanted to thank you for coming in and uh, giving your presentation, but I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so when you advocate for, you know, open borders, are you talking about, you know, physical border as in the wall between U.S. and Mexico, or are you talking about, um, like, citizenship um, restrictions, like quotas and, you know, all the red tape that people have to go through, or are you advocating for more? of the citizenship red tape? Oh, great question. Um, because you could, that's right, because as I said before, you could have sort of both. I think uh, at this point, you know, obviously it, it, it's hard to justify, like I said, the open borders philosophically at this point. Uh, I would definitely want at least the freedom of movement. And it's interesting how this is where, where I'll, I'll Come, I'll be on the team of people that are even more conservative, right? So, so for example, the libertarians would argue that this is, this is what you want, because if you don't have more open borders, you create these uh, market inefficiencies, for example. Right? You've got more labor in one area, you've got this area that needs labor, right? And, and the border is somehow keeping them separate. Now, the reason I hesitate, though, is that when you have guest workers, or just people that come in and, and don't have full membership, then you start creating this sort of second-class status. And any time you've got a community where you've got second class status, you've got you know, the real members and the not so real members, then you get into real problems. So I think that's, that's a great question. I, 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 I want some protections for immigrants, but maybe the, the protections that I really want are, are, gonna, are gonna have to come with citizenship. So maybe we need to start thinking of things like global citizenship. So again, as philosophers, we can say this, right? So I'm not a political science or sociology department. 
So as a philosopher, I can advocate for a global, so which sound, I think is, is, is great. Thank you for that good question. I think it's great to see that you're speaking at one of our local um, in educational institutions and that young people are raising these questions. When you made the statement that where you are born greatly determines your life chances. Yes. That also greatly impacts who gets the privilege of gaining citizenship um, yes. into this country. So whether you are a male under the age of 25 from Lebanon, yes. you do not have the rights, same rights as an Israeli trying to come in, even less rights if you are from Latin America. And when you look at that issue of disproportionality, we have to look at that issue Absolutely. also because it is, we have divided people by race, by class, by gender. And it begins with employment laws as well. So I wanted to thank you. And I also wanted to thank the people here that are bringing up these issues because this is how we're going to promote change. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I'll be hanging around if you, if you all want to chat some more. <laughs>